Okay, Daniel, I think we can start now. What do you think? Sounds great. I think Peter is going to be leading most of the discussion today. I'm the closer. <laughs> okay. So, hello, everybody. Hoping you are continue joining us in our nice course. Today we have two of my friends. Correct me if I spell it in bad way. I'm sorry. So, okay. Daniel, the chief resident in University of Tennessee, and uh, Peter. Close, Piotr or Peter. Correct. <laughs> and uh, Peter, from he is a medical physicist in uh, Stanford University. And today we are going to pass through the chart rounds and peer review, very important topic and great slides. They are prepared uh, very well. So we all ears and, and listening to you. go on. Perfect. So I can, uh, can I share the screen? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Oh, <clears throat> sound good on my end. Oh yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so I'm going to steal the screen here and share our slides and go to presentation mode. Okay, perfect. All right, so thank you for the introduction. My name is Piotr, or Peter, and with me is Daniel. We're going to talk about chart rounds and peer review. And so we're going to try and break down the class today into like two sections. So I'll talk about the first part and kind of just introduce chart rounds and the concept and why it's important. And we thought it would be fun to do a second aspect, which is actually do a, a mock chart rounds with you guys. So we prepared seven patients that are terrible. They all have mistakes and we want to see if you guys can find the mistakes in the chart rounds to kind of, you know, to uh, basically uh, pretend that we're doing this in real life, but, but you know, there's mistakes in them. So you kind of have a leg up there. So I'm going to reuse a lot of slides from the past couple of um, lessons about QA, because I think this all works really closely together. And peer review at Chart Rounds is actually a big part of the QA, as, as I'll kind of try and talk about. So you've seen this slide. You know, our QA program in radiation therapy and in many different industries can be modeled as these slices of cheese, where each test or each check is a slice of cheese. And obviously, no check is perfect, so it's got holes in the cheese. And really, the idea of a QA program is that these holes never line up to let an error go through. So what one check misses, another check has to, you know, basically find in order to basically block these errors from happening. And it's only when all the holes line up that you'll actually get an error. So obviously our QA program isn't just a slice of cheese. It looks more like this, you know, it's a pretty complicated workflow. There's lots of people that are involved, but I want to kind of bring attention to this slice of cheese up at the front. Okay. If you notice, you know, T has got a really nice breakdown of all the different responsibilities. Hopefully you guys can see my mouse. But you can see that in the very beginning, the intake part of radiation therapy process really relies with just the, the MD, just the physician. And this is a single slice of cheese that does this check. And so things like the diagnosis, the dose, the fractionation, even targets, laterality, those things all percolate down the line and aren't really often double checked by anybody down the line, like all the other different details are of the radiation therapy plan. Tia might have mentioned in the past this Royals. It's like a database of incidents or errors within the U.S. <clears throat> It's a really nice thing that we you know, people will submit errors that they find in the clinic and this national uh, database can be mined and determined. And so a couple of the findings that they always kind of stress is that physician errors in defining targets and dose and prescription and fractionation are really difficult to detect, right? Because no one's going to check these because we don't have the expertise uh, down the line to double check these. And also things that can percolate the entire way through the treatment are basically the most dangerous. So IGRT, wrong targets, wrong prescription, things like that. They're very, you know, very important things to look at. And so really peer review is this extra slice of cheese that we're going to add to the front to double check this aspect. But, you know, we don't have to look at just the first slice of cheese or where the MD is making the determination of how to treat the patient. From this same database, it looks at about 30% of all errors end up at this treatment planning step, you know, basically that somebody makes an error. And even though we have all these physics checks and therapy checks and second checks to check the therapy plan, it turns out that, you know, from Saffron is another database, an international database rather than the U.S. one. It actually turns out that 80% of the errors that go all the way through to treatment 
should have been caught by a physics check, right? So even though we have all these physics checks, they're great, they catch a lot, but they don't catch everything. And so peer review shouldn't only just check the initial part, that initial slice of cheese of the, of the MD determining, you know, what dose and what fractionation, but it should be an all-encompassing check of the entire plan if, if, if we can. So basically taking a step backwards a little bit. So, you know, you can model uh, a radiation therapy process into two different kind of bins. One is peer review, you know, the QA of peer review, which is going to check professional decisions and qualitative uh, decisions. So things that don't have like a number associated with them, don't have a yes or a no, a simple yes or no answer. So that's what peer review is going to look at. Whereas QA and QC, which is, you know, what kind of physics does a lot of the time, that's sort of the opposite side of that. So it's technical, yes, no, pass, fail type of criteria. And that's sort of what physics checks. And we tend to think of QA as just this, this, this leg of this flow chart. Especially when we move into more complex treatments, you know, as you move from 2D to 3D to IMRT and beyond, everybody's very aware that you have to have a tighter machine tolerance. You know, your isocenter has to be good if you're going to treat SRS. But, you know, that's not the only thing that you should focus on. There's a second leg of this, of this process, which is the professional decision. And peer review is just as important as you move into more and more complex treatments. Reviewing contours, reviewing uh, margins, reviewing intent to treat, those are just as important as you know, making sure the machine can do the thing that they can do. So traditionally, what does peer review look like, right? That's sort of the overview. Traditionally, re peer review kind of breaks down into chart rounds, which I you know, just had half an hour ago here. And this is you know, a weekly review of cases within the department, usually new cases for us. You review various aspects of each case, such as the dose, the fields, treatment plan, uh, patient setup, and other issues. It includes you know, various members of the team, so physicians are always there, physicists, dosimetrists, planners, nurses sometimes. You can basically discuss cases that are interesting. Most of the time, cases just go through, they look good. But you can then see if there's minor changes or major changes that are suggested amongst the peers, amongst the group. And you know, if you look at the literature, it's about 5 to 10% of cases are identified that will need some change, which is pretty substantial. You know, one in 10 cases will have some suggestion from somebody in order to change. And I think that's a very valuable thing. And in the US, it's actually required for accreditation, right? So in the US, we have these bodies that will accredit, accredit radiation therapy programs. And so we need to do these. We need to show that we're doing these in order to get accreditation. But that's not the only kind of way to do peer review. There's other opportunities. So there's secondary tumor boards. So basically physicians from multiple disciplines, so not just radiation oncology, but physicians from multiple disciplines like surgery and chemo and you know, whatnot can meet and discuss new patients and kind of figure out what the most optimal um, care for that patient is, especially in kind of complex cases. This is very valuable. However, you know, tumor boards are less, less beneficial when the patient's already under treatment. Other things you know, that you can think about are kind of mortality and morbidity more, uh, rounds. So if there's any patients that have any morbidity or unexpected adverse events, you can review those. And that's kind of a, a form of peer review. We do something here at Stanford or in my local satellite site that's really neat. Um, I've never done it anywhere else. It's called on-treatment rounds, where not only are we reviewing every new patient that comes up, but we review patients every week that are on treatment. And it's very nice for me as a physicist I get to see, you know, if patients are slowly developing complications, if patients are not setting up as well as they were on the first day versus, you know, the 30th day. So this is a very good feedback for the rest of the team. So it's a really nice idea. And there's some online resources too. There's chartrounds.org, um, which has an African subgroup. And in the U.S., there, interestingly enough, the U.S. has a lot of smaller radiation therapy clinics, radiation oncology departments, where sometimes there's only a single physician, and peer review becomes very difficult in those situations. So ASTRO, which is the Radiation Oncology Association in the U.S., is developing like a peer-to-peer -peer where they'll match you with somebody in order to be able to review your contours, review your decisions, and things like that. So there's lots of opportunities. It doesn't have to be chart rounds, but we'll talk about chart rounds the majority of the talk here. So, you know, one thing to kind of be considerate is that there is no strict requirements for what chart rounds is. It really needs to be determined by your local level. Like what works for me in a clinic that treats, you know, 60 patients is not going to work for a clinic that works, treats 250 patients a day. 
So it really needs to be determined by your staff, your local conditions, and your leadership. There's, you know, I put down two very good kind of guidelines from Astro. It's, you know, that's what we know. I kind of outline, and I'll talk a little bit more about the resources after. But there's, you know, there's some good guides on what you should check and how you should check it. So we really encourage you, to hopefully at the end of this talk, to see the benefit of it and try to implement it in some fashion. Okay, so how do we do this, or when? At what point do we? try and review a patient is it before the first fraction is it within the first week so you know again it depends on what your local conditions are going to be like but it show, there's evidence to suggest that the more time you have before a patient starts a plan or starts a treatment excuse me the more likely you're going to suggest and implement changes that kind of makes sense i think we've all been in a situation where i have a patient that you know, it's not the best plan that i could have i'm checking a plan it's not the best you know i wouldn't treat my mom this way but the patient's on the table in 15 minutes and there's just no time to change it. I'll try and change it maybe for the next fraction or maybe in, in a week or something. So it's, it's you know, it, it's the nature of the beast, but the earlier on you can get a review, the earlier on you can put review the patient, the more ample, the more chance that you'll actually make a change. So before treatment is ideal, but as early as possible. The next question is who? So which patients should go to chart rounds? Is it feasible to review everybody? Should we limit to disease sites? Which patients have priority? So again, it's got to be determined by by your local, you know, what you what you guys want to achieve. But there's a really interesting paper that I found, which was basically they took, you know, chart rounds, what we do on a regular basis, over several institutions, and they embedded fake plans with errors in them. And they wanted to see, you know, can people catch these and how are people catching them? And interestingly enough, they realized that within if the error uh, in, occurred within the first 75, or excuse me, within the first 30 minutes of chart rounds, 75% of those errors were caught. If it was after 30 minutes, it's 25, right? So it goes to show you that the longer that these chart rounds are, the more patients that you have, you start to kind of get fatigued and you're not paying attention as much. So, you know, our recommendation is shorter chart rounds, maybe break them up into disease sites, you know, so have, especially with, you know, how many uh, patients a lot of your clinics treat, Maybe it makes sense to break them up into smaller groups. Maybe have you know, 30 small 30-minute chart rounds rather than one huge hour and a half chart rounds, which should sometimes happen. And again, ideally, you know, you do review all cases, but obviously that's not possible. So often in some, some places I've worked at, we reviewed only curative cases, so palliative cases weren't reviewed. And then if that's not possible, maybe you know, kind of try and figure out which cases are going to be have probable complications, which are going to be sort of the tough cases and just try and review those. But again, you know, breaking up a meeting into smaller chunks, smaller groups will probably be more effective. Also for the who, uh, who should attend and how large of a group. So I think we kind of will recommend that for sure there has to be a second visit, excuse me, a second physician in order to review the first physician's contours and decision to treat and and basically you know, the treatment plan. A physicist is always kind of present where I've worked at. It's very, you know, I would say it's highly recommended because we can do that technical aspect. So again, if you think about radiation therapy as being, you know, professional decisions and technical decisions. So the physics group can check the technical part and the second, phys uh, second physician will check the professional decisions. But I think you should try to expand this to all the other possible people. So therapists are very valuable at least because they can bring back feedback of how patients can set it up or how you know, some of the treatments go. So the person who's doing the planning, I think it's very important to, to be present at these to get feedback again about their plans. And residents are, this is a great educational opportunity, right? As a resident, you're often kind of running around, but to have an hour dedicated or 30 minutes dedicated to sit down and really kind of see that everything that's coming up, all the different ways that people are treating these patients, I think it's a very good educational um, opportunity. So I guess maybe the most important question is, what do you review? So this table here, table two, is comes from the Astro kind of white paper on it. And it does a really good job of kind of breaking down exactly what they recommend you should review and how important each of these things is, right? So ultimately, you know, decision to treat, history, workup, diagnosis, the general treatment approach, and the target definition, so including what you're using for margins and how they're reflected on IGRT, right? If you're using really tight margins, but you're not imaging, you know, that kind of thing has to be discussed. You can also look at OAR definitions, making sure that there's contours that, uh, that are there you know, for organs at risk are, are good. Plan Daniel? Sorry um, for 
interruption. Mm -hmm. I have a message on the chat room to raise your voice. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll try and get closer to the. Is this better? Yeah, they said yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll try and speak a little bit clearer and louder. And then, yeah, basically doing a general plan quality check as well. And delivery is important too. So that's why I think having a radiation therapist in there is beneficial because you can kind of get an idea of how this, this patient will be delivered, even though you might not have started it yet. The other white paper from ASTRO that, or guidelines, excuse me, called um, Safety is No Accident also kind of breaks down the things that people should be checking. And it kind of does a nice job where everybody, you know, each role has both a peer review aspect and a quality insurance aspect. And I think it does a nice job saying, kind of making it seem like, making it obvious that everybody has a role in quality assurance, whether it's the peer review part or the quality assurance part. But again, things like target definition, selecting the dose and the, the, tr the treatment techniques, you know, making sure that even for physics, you know, a peer review for physics, even though we do a lot of the technical checks, having an independent output check. So we, on an annual basis, will have IROC, which is like an organization here that sends us nanodots. I think the IAEA also does them. You can irradiate these nanodots and send them back. They'll verify that the calibration of your machine is within tolerance, you know, within some tolerance. So making sure that you're not making some drastic mistakes. So there's lots of opportunity for peer review, not just in the chart round settings and not just for physicians. But one of the most important questions is how do we do this? So in the olden days, before COVID, you know, it used to be 50, 60 people crammed into a room with a projector and we would go over the cases and we present them. But now obviously with COVID, we've definitely moved and we would suggest that this is probably the way to go is move to an electronic review. So this opens the door to collaboration with external people because it's easier to share plans. If you're doing everything electronically, you can use built-in tools. So if any of you have clips. It does, you know, very nice checklists and very nice clinical protocols that tell you if you've passed or failed certain criteria. And again, it's useful for social uh, distancing during COVID. So this is what our chart rounds you know, kind of tends to look like now instead of a big room. It's just a big Zoom meeting. The other thing about uh, that we would kind of suggest is try and be as standardized as possible. So it's much easier to pick up errors. If every plan looks the same and you use the same names for plans, if you use the same uh, colors for structures, if you use the same colors for isodoses, that becomes very easy to pick up an error. But one of the best things you can do to a physician, if you're a physicist and you're planning a plan, change your 100% isodose to like a red color that's usually reserved for like a 110, and you'll see their head explode. I mean, it's simple things we kind of um, tend to ignore, but you know, we are kind of, we are very good at determining patterns. And so if you keep things standardized, it becomes much easier to find errors. One of the biggest things to achieve a good um, chart round is you need to have time. So this slide is kind of more for leadership in the crowd, if there's anybody, you know, from leadership is that if time is protected, there's a study that they did to see, you know, how chart rounds, how many people are coming to chart rounds and participating in it. And they found that, you know, if if the leadership allows for, you know, an hour of time that's blocked and dedicated to chart rounds, obviously people will attend. And likewise, if attendance is incentivized, so if there's like a either money bonus or recognition or anything like that to encourage people to come, people will come. If it's not there, people won't. And they're pretty, pretty significant impact. And kind of lastly is that you need to have a culture of safety, right? So this can be kind of um, difficult because you are encouraging people to try and find errors of your work. And so you have to have uh, an, an environment where it's okay to criticize each other. It's okay to learn from these mistakes and make sure that there's no you know, punishment. A mistake is a mistake and it's better caught than hidden. And again, from this, from this study that looked at you know, embedding fake errors in chart rounds to see if people can detect them, it was an interesting where once people started to realize that there might be fake patients in these chart rounds, they actually started to pick them up more. So 33% at the beginning to 75% over the time of this clinical trial, because people knew that they were being tested. And so people started to pay attention a little bit more. So I think there's, there's a lot of, kind of ways you can incentivize and make it this, you know, a good thing for your um, clinic. And, and you'll actually get a lot of benefit for it. But it really comes down to leadership, right? So 
the, the, the people, the directors, the clinics, the chairs of the departments, they have to set a good example. They have to give you time. They have to give you the resources. And really, you know, that's when you'll get a lot of benefit from Charlotte. The last couple of spots here is to keep it brief, you know, this seems like a huge task, but really presenting a case, again, in one of these uh, papers, they said that, you know, majority of cases, so 60, about 60% 60 of the cases that they presented, it only takes about one to four minutes to present. So these aren't huge things that you're doing per patient. You know, it's a minute to two minutes per patient. If it's a simple case, off it goes. And the last little bit is to communicate. And we've had this happen numerous times where a change is suggested for a plan that we present, but nobody writes it down, you know, oh, I'll do it, I'll get to it later, and then you forget, and then it actually never happens, which is kind of the worst case scenario. So, you know, communicate it. We've, we've become very good at now having a little spreadsheet that we'll write down if it's a major change, minor change. And again, you know, 5 to 10% of patients that you bring up at chart rounds will have some sort of change. So it, it, is, it doesn't happen pretty often. And so you have to have a way of communicating that to, you know, back to the physics department or back to the therapist. Okay, so now we're going to kind of, or you know, in the next couple of slides, we're going to jump and ship and actually try to run some chart rounds. And hopefully this is a little bit more interactive. So you guys can answer through the chat or you guys can answer, you know, you guys can chime in. But before we do that, we'll kind of give you a little bit of like these plan review tools. So this is a couple of slides that Daniel gave me. And there, you can find them on this YouTube link, or you can just search for Arreos Contra Cancer Plan Evaluation on YouTube, and you'll find the videos these are from. But I think this is a great kind of acronym to think about while you're reviewing the next set of plans that we have. Uh, and that's CV CHOP, so this acronym. So C is for contours, B, B in arrangements, and then you can look at coverage, hotspots, organs at risk, and prescription, okay? So for example, in this case here, are all the contours of this plan accounted for, right? So if you kind of look, here's my beam arrangement, here's my sort of high dose region, I got kidneys, spinal cord, I got sort of the stomach here. Looks like I'm missing a liver. So this would be a good example of a contour that's actually missed, right? And this is gonna get some high dose, so we should be looking at um, the reporting of dose out here. Hey, Peter. Yep. For the next few points, what if we asked our uh, participants to answer in the chat Okay, sure, sure. Maybe get a warm up before we do our, our uh... actual ones. Yeah. Okay. So what about here? What do you guys see is missing? I kind of feel like I want to give points to like centers and have them battle. <laughs> but what, if somebody can answer in the chat, I'm, how do I put my chat on? Okay. Uh, can you see the chat room? The spinal cord, spinal cord. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So we're missing the spinal cord and this head and neck. So that's like, you know, the first thing that you should make sure it's there. Let me just try and... So what about here? So now this isn't looking at uh, contours anymore. This is looking at beam arrangements. Can you find one of these beam or, one, or you know, some, some issues with the beam arrangements here? What, what, what's wrong in beam arrangement here, guys? Can you see anything? Well, this beam here coming in through the contralateral lung, you know, it's pretty far away from this target. It's probably not delivering a ton of dose, but it's probably contributing a lot of dose to the contralateral lung and the heart. It's probably not necessary. What about, oh, this one is the same, you know, so this one's coming in through the spinal canal or spinal cord. So that's probably not a good beam arrangement to choose. What about here? What do, you, do you see anything wrong with these beams? So this is a beam's eye view of this beam coming in sort of laterally or obliquely into the brain. And so you got your target. I think you got a brain stem here. You got uh, chiasm and cochlea somewhere. I think it's pretty open uh, and included all the critical. Exactly. Yeah. So this is way too open. You could definitely tighten that beam or beam uh, aperture yeah. up and, and you know make that a lot more conformal than it needs to be. Okay. And then what about this sort of beam arrangement? What do you think is, we could improve in that? What's wrong in this? Hello. Spinal spinal cord is in the way of the beam. Yeah, actually, that's what I was thinking too. But this is an exit beam. I think this is the entrance here. So this is the yeah. entrance. So exit is probably okay. Well, at least for this, I think there's nothing. I think this plan was approved and delivered. So again, and it goes to show you, you know, that it's, sometimes it's kind of quite tricky to pick things up. So, so the next little bit, we're going to try this out. So Daniel's going to present some fake cases, and you know, as we would in chart rounds, and I'll try to run them in 
in my Google box. So just a sec, I'm gonna try and share something on my screen. All right, Daniel, do you wanna present the first case? It's gonna be the brain. I think we're gonna go in order. Can you guys see my Eclipse patient here? Yes. Hey, give me just one second to set up my, I'm getting my um, desktop set up here. Sure, sure. I'll let Daniel do this because as a physicist, I feel like I can't pronounce any of the any of the uh, the, the drugs that these people were got. So, <laughs> okay. So one of the things I noticed was everybody got shy in front of everyone else when we started throwing out answers, and I respect that because I'm the same way. So what I would like to do before I get going is say, Peter, wow. That was an outstanding presentation. I, you know, I love what Ben Lee says. He says, all our learners, all our teachers. When I think about all of my teachers, you know, thinking about the format of this, I think you presented in, you know, 30 minutes what, had, what took me three years to really appreciate in my training. So hopefully that's helpful to centers. The other thing is I like what you said about there's, there's options, different ways to do this. You know, in my adult center, at West Cancer Center of the University of Tennessee, what we do is every morning, we take about 30 minutes and review all the new curative cases with physicians, therapists, and physicists. And that's our daily chart rounds. But at St. Jude, where I do my pediatrics work, we do weekly chart rounds, just as you mentioned, with 50, 60 people in the room or a Zoom chat. So one of the things that I like, I have to say, I like about the daily chart rounds is, First and foremost, it's the place that I have learned the most as a trainee, but it's also, I think the informal daily format fits into the data about having, you know, 30 minutes of, of cognitive ability to, to catch all the misses, which that paper you talked about, talked about, but it's also nice to see all the staff every day and see all of our teammates every day. And it has been a positive, positive thing for our culture. Oh, good. Okay. Great. So Thanks. I'll get, I'll get going here. What I was going to say is, because everyone's bashful answering publicly, would you please direct your answers to me? And I will announce the first person to give me a winning answer. Does that sound like a good plan to everybody? So I've got my chat open here. And when someone gets the answer, I will stop my awkward silence. And you will, you'll get some credit instead of any shame. So this first case, we're going to do seven cases, and I'll say all of them have something tricky about them. So feel free to answer, I want to say wildly, but answer uh, multiple times. You don't just get one submission. We have this case one. So for history, and in our chart rounds, so the resident physicians present the cases. very, And that's also what we do in the adult and pediatric centers. And so it's good as a trainee to get your reps in for describing this. So it's funny that Peter says, oh, I don't know the words, which is, I just take it for granted I've learned the language. So this is a 59 year old female. She has extensive stage small cell lung cancer, the high grade neuroendocrine tumor, and it's metastatic to the liver, bones, and lymph nodes. The patient has had three cycles of cisplatin, etoposide, and dervalumab with exgeva and has developed metastases on the MRI of the brain. So the patient has press syndrome, the seizures have resolved on steroids. We discussed the case at Neuro-Oncology Tumor Board and the outside MRI was reviewed. There are multiple new enhancing brain lesions. They're consistent with METs. We did another MRI brain showing that they're growing and there's multiple METs and that she has small cell histology and rapidly progressive brain METs. We recommend whole brain radiation, 30 gray and 10 fractions using a standard 3D whole brain technique. So you can see there's two parallel post beams here, laterally, I'm going to try. So as Peter clicks through, would you please text me directly, what is wrong with this plan? Just for feedback, I don't have anybody typing in answers at this point. Okay, Daniel, let me just uh, say it briefly in Arabic. Shabab, this is metastatic breast cancer in brain. She's 56 years old, and we're supposed to give her, please remind the dose again. 30 grain infractions. Okay. Palliative radiotherapy, whole cranium, 30 grain and 10 fractions. The plan is not 
I think, no, I, I think A and lens in, uh, include the B. Sorry? I think the lens and the A include this in, in B. So who said that? Very good, doctor. I got a similar correct answer from uh, Dr. Bastoon Hassan, uh, Dr. Han Yassin, and Dr. Ahmed Mustafa. So good job to everybody that participated. I hope this is uh, making you less scared. I'm going to give you good credit if you if you get it right. <laughs> so that's good. That's the first guys. They're not shielding the lenses, and that is a mistake that needs to be fixed. So let's go on to the second case. So uh, can I add? Okay, so the shield and uh, is there is a possibility of making some collimation or to or this is okay so so this is the original plan so this is how we actually treated the patient okay. the other one i basically just removed the the lens shield and the, the face okay. shield there so this okay. is how it should look you know these 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 blocks here will really you know block out the, the lens and then you face those whereas the the air plan that I okay. showed, I mean, it was just missing those, okay. those, yeah. you know, the planner, the physicist forgot basically. Okay. <laughs> so you can see the 90%, the green kind of dose is just all over the eyes and face. So. Okay, second case. Okay, case two. So case two is a patient with Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is a 47 year old male. He has stage 2BX, mixed cellularity, classic Hodgkin's lymphoma. The patients had five cycles of plan six cycles of ABVD and had an interim PET scan after two cycles that showed a, a good response, uh, but not a full response, a dobil 2 response. The plan is to receive and deliver consolidative radiotherapy to the bulky mediastinal disease. The patient has extensive mediastinal disease. The initial chest x-ray and PET CT show that also has B symptoms. There's more than three sites of disease. The elevated ESR all show that unfavorable prognostic factors are present. The patient has had bleomycin, but that was dropped through the chemotherapy due to toxicity. The interim PET, as I mentioned, was considered at tumor board and the tumor board recommended consolidated radiotherapy. And the patient's gonna have their final cycle of ABVD and if that remains Duvil 2 or lower, they will proceed with radiation therapy. So we're going to also review his pulmonary function test. We're going to talk to his pulmonologist prior to RT. And pending, he doesn't have a full response and that he also has adequate P PFTs. This is a plan for pre-chemotherapy. Uh, treatment, we are, tre sorry, I'm reading. <laughs> we are treating the pre-chemotherapy FDG avid disease in the mediastinum to a total dose of 30 gray and 20 fractions over the course of four weeks. So I think, you know, from the physics perspective, you know, it's a kind of a four field, modified four field box. It's a very large tumor. So this is a very challenging case. A hot, hot spot of 110, which is a little high, but, you know, to get coverage, I think kind of needed that. So is there, can you guys think of, oh, and it's four fields here all 15x. So can you guys see anything? And I think this is a really good example for me of kind of what I uh, alluded to earlier, you know, the clinical history can be so complex sometimes with these cases that I, you know, I kind of, I can get very lost in it. So you just have to be, you know, when I, when we do these reviews, you just kind of have to pay attention to your little bit that you can, that you can benefit from, I guess, or, or, or contribute to. Okay. So what would be some criticisms of this plan? Just answer to me privately. If you like, or if you're brave, you can use your audio as well. And Soha, if you need to translate, feel free to. Yeah, so to sum up, this is a 47 Hodgkin lymphoma patient uh, who received six, six cycles of ABBD with good response. We need to consolidate radiotherapy to the mediastinal lymph node with the dose of 30 gray over 20 fraction for four weeks. So, El Plan de Fee, what do you think? Okay, I'm going to give credit to Dr. Hassan. He has the insight. The AP field is missing. No, it's there. There is an AP field. Good try, though. I kind of agree with him. The waiting. Oh, I see the, the AP field now, too. Yeah, but it's I think the yet. point. So you're kind of on the right track. Yes. We've got to get another. Uh, 
Another good suggestion that the apex of the heart's not properly shielded. Mayeda suggests that the, the, the witch is uh, in the opposite sides. No, they're, they're okay because they, I think they're, they're trying to basically balance out the hot spots to try and get them. Now, this one's okay. a little challenging. Maybe I can give you a hint. This patient's quite large. If you look at how big this patient is, you know, you can see they're, they're quite, quite big. This is the separation is very big. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we compromise the widgets to overcome the hot spot, Mayada, regardless of the direction. Let me just say it in Arabic because we raised up to put the, the witches in in the air side. So this is no more because we, we just compromise the hot spot with the witches. It's not by direction. Okay. We got okay. some other suggestion. The spinal cord is in the field. Yeah. Peter, would you like to discuss that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. This definitely could have been tweaked a little bit more. You know, there's definitely some shielding that we could improve. But I think, I think the one thing I want to point out is this is pretty tricky, but basically if you look closely, you could see that this patient, the entire kind of area here has been cut off by the CT. The patient's so big that we're missing tissue out here. You can kind of see if I window level, you can almost mm -hmm. see the circle of the bore. And so we're missing tissue and we're mm -hmm. shooting through it. So this beam is completely inaccurate. You know, it would be like five, 10% off potentially mm -hmm. just because we're missing it. So that's a big mistake and it happens all the time uh, because you know sometimes people are very large and so this is a, a big mistake the other thing that i kind of have through yeah poor directions there's no need to come in through this side there's easier directions to come through and lastly this is something that we usually do is when we're shooting through the lung a lot we will try not to use even for a large patient we will try not to use high energy beams this is the highest i have but your penumbra your dose, your low dose will cover much more area in the lung if you use these high energy beams than if you use um, something smaller. This is definitely a, a tricky one. And if you want to see the, the actual plan was an IMRT plan, so it looks very different. Oh, that didn't work. So. so that's a really good case. And I think for the clinicians, as you transition to a 3D program and using more CT stimulation, what you'll need to think about is uh, our patients fitting through the bore. In uh, my part of America, we have a lot of overweight patients. We have large bore CTs. We have also have small bore CTs. And so not only making sure they fit in the bore, but also making sure they fit in the field size and thinking of this up front is really important. So thank you, everybody. We'll move on to the next case. So case three. Also, for that case, I intentionally made it drawn out history. Basically, the patient didn't have a good response to chemotherapy, has Hodgkin's lymphoma, needs consolidated radiation therapy. And every time we have a chart rounds, there is some doctor who's going to present the case in a ramble about way, in a way that's not concise. And it's important to be concise for patient safety. You don't want their, the story of their elementary education. You don't want to know what their favorite color was. You want to know what cancer they had in one sentence and what you're going to do about it. So case three, this is a patient who's having a, a spinal cord treatment. So this patient's 38 years old, has a metastatic ocular melanoma to the liver, bone, and brain. He previously competed, completed treatment with uh, immunotherapy in 2019. And in early 2020, he cyber knife radio surgery, high dose radio surgery to ablative doses to the left Meckel's cave in the brain, the fifth nerve in the brain, and at the seventh thoracic vertebra. He then had progression all throughout his body, and he also had another palliative radiotherapy course to the pelvis and left humerus. Currently, what we're doing is palliative radiation therapy to a metastasis in the thoracic spine to a total dose of 20. This is another tricky one, and I will tell you a hint is in the history. And we will have an awkward silence until I start to get answers. There's 60 of us, so at least five or six people can text me. Yes, the weighing is not appropriate, but that's not it, not on this case. Somebody else said 20 gray and 10 fractions. That's a pretty good guess, but not in this case. 20 and 10 might be more appropriate for a multiple myeloma metastasis. The, the fractionation is not the issue with this case. Good participation here. Keep them coming. 
So, gradient coming inside the vertebrae itself. So, I'm looking for the hundred percent. Does it? Oh, okay, okay, it's covered. Oh, Guesses, I'll give you an answer. And I think Dan did a, a, made a good suggestion. It's the actual plan. Is this is the actual plan that was treated? So at least I hope there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> so I didn't change the actual plan. So yeah, Dan. All right, good. Okay, so what was previously treated is important here. The thoracic vertebra was previously treated with cyberknife and an ablative dose of radiation. So what that means is this patient could have gotten 24 gray in one fraction to the seventh vertebra, and now we're going to do re-irradiation. And so bringing that all together into the planning decision-making is really important, and it's important to do combined plan analysis to make sure that you're not going to... No, what we would do in terms of... You could technically put on doses, you know, some of the doses from a previous treatment, see where the dose went, and then kind of just adjust your fields to try and match fields as much as possible. So that's just, I wanted to kind of show, since this already has some contours on there. Okay, number four. Okay. okay. So this 50-year-old male has metastatic lung cancer, adenocarcinoma. He received chemotherapy to bilateral choroidal metastasis in the eye in 2018. He had radiotherapy to the rib metastases in 2019. He had cyberknife to three sites of vertebral metastases in 2020. Now he has lesions in the left femur, left femur that is going to be treated to, let's see, what dose did you choose here? That's 25, yeah. So, we're planning on doing palliative radiation, 20 gray, and five fractions to the left femur. Okay, it's not, the problem is not the field is excessively open. There's something else. So we have a question of, yes, it is a left side metastasis. So we've got another submission. All right, so the question of left side metastasis is the point. What side is being treated here? The right side. Uh, you got to treat the right side of your patient, the correct side of your patient. And, you know, this actually happened in our clinic recently, not that it was set up incorrectly, but when we sat down to plan a patient just like this, the patient had been simulated feet first, and we're not used to seeing that. So you got to treat the right side. You got to make sure you're treating the right side. And uh, that is what's wrong with this patient. You got to treat the correct yeah, and side. And I got to say, I, I think that you hit the nail on the head with, if you do feet first, that throws people off so much uh, that it's a huge, huge potential for it. This one isn't the first, but, but yeah, you're, you're totally right. Okay, this is fun. Okay, so I'm going to go through the next couple of cases a little bit faster. We have the next patient is a prostate cancer patient. He's a 67-year-old patient with Gleason 3 plus 4 adenocarcinoma. Uh, it's low to intermediate grade. He had a PSA of 9. Now it's at 3 on hormone therapy for a couple months. Overall, he's good prognosis. Uh, he had, um, he did not select that. So we have a plan to treat the patient in 80 gray and 40 fractions. We're gonna use a um, rectal spacer, uh, space OAR before simulation and also put in Calypso markers into his prostate for, for image guidance. And uh, this is an example of his plan. So to speed things up, this is an error in a contour that was treated or that was planned to. So maybe we can show the 100 gray oxidose line or the 100% the oxidose line. And Oh, good. Okay. So someone, Dr. Hassan, good problem with this is you're only treating the prostate, not a CTP, not a clinical target volume. And so that's an excellent catch. And, uh, you know, Thinking back, this actually has happened in our center, and it's a pretty practical thing that, you know, especially if you have a, a dosimetrist student, the PTV, the switch model to this, and it actually does happen. Got to make sure you're treating the PTV, not the GTV, not just the prostate. So let's do case number six. 
So you guys should all be prepared for case number six. We talked about this in our lecture on how to treat external beam radiation cervical cancer. This first patient, it's our patient from our homework. And if you've done the homework, you know it's a 50-year-old with FIGO stage 2B, moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. She presented with vaginal bleeding and pelvic pressure workup showed a squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. CT showed a six, and a, six by five centimeter mass uh, parametrial invasion. There are bilateral parametrial disease involvement and involvement of the left upper third of the vagina. And there's no lymph node metastases or metastases on, on, in, in other organs. And so the plan is for a definitive chemo radiation, external beam followed by brachytherapy implant. And the external beam component is planned here. It's a standard pelvic field, 45 gray and 25 fractions. So these are 6x fields, um, 10x, 45 and 25. And these are contours here. These are welcome. Okay, we've got a good submission. So something's wrong with the blocks. So Peter, do you have any other comments? So the you can see the bladder, where's the bladder? There's the bladder there. So that's you know initially what we were treated with, and then this is what the, the scan was. It's got a bunch of contrast type. They shouldn't have a full base box for the, the as well. So that we can all take criticism. I made those blocks. I thought they were great. <laughs> we would typically do 50 and 25 to all three sides, but so this is the plan. What's wrong with this? Okay, good. We've got a note, you know, not more than too much lung. Okay, that's good. What else? All right. There's like three things wrong here. Too much heart. Good. Okay. Too much heart, too much lung. And then, uh, okay, yeah, the great one. point. Dr. Hassan, you're hitting home runs. The skin is not, does not have enough flash. Exactly, yeah. And then you're the only good. other... And then there's one more thing. Did we show the super clap, Phil? Super clap, yeah. Good, good. Dr. Mustafa, good job with the heart dose. That's right. So now what's wrong with this super clap field? So it's not that level one or two are included. It's not the position of the patient. Both of those are good. So if you go back to the actual DRR of the super clap field, it's pretty obvious once I tell you waiting for a text from someone that, okay, wrong gantry answer. Yeah, we could criticize a little bit of those things, but this is something that is not blocked. Yeah, the head of the humerus is not blocked. Good job. Okay, so that's our last case. Um, it's missing blocks. We've got to draw blocks for the humerus, for, you know, potentially for the lung, for the heart. This is a really good case, and, uh, and I think a really good example of kind of bread and butter, high volume things that we're going to see. So thank you everyone for your participation. It is 12.02 and I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Before I stay and we talk about questions on homework one and two, I just want to say thank you so much to Peter and Soha. Peter, do you have any final words? No, no, I think hopefully this was kind of a fun game, kind of get everybody's kind of thoughts growing and, and yeah, I mean, we find it extremely useful and I think well, I hope they do. you guys uh, implement something, you know, there's, there's lots of ways to do this, but it's really important. Hey, I'm going to give an MVP award to uh, Dr. Bastoon Hassan. Good job, doctor. You were the most engaged, at least in the private chat, and I uh, really appreciate you contributing. So kudos to everybody else. Great job. Soha, do you have anything to add? Well, thank you so much, Daniel. It was really uh, very interactive and uh, a bit funny. So to have these tricks, <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoyed myself. So... <laughs> I, I like I'm glad we had a good time. So I'll try to be fun enough to follow. Hey, I'm going to stay on. And as the per I, I, I'm happy to answer any questions on homework two and three, yeah. contouring homework. Yeah, Mayada and the guys from Mosul have some questions. So go on, Mayada, please, and your colleague. What, what, uh, what, how can we help in your homework? 2D, 3D. Okay, so she finished her homework on uh, case four, uh, on, on uh, the homework four, but when she followed the same instructions for homework two and three, 
she cannot find the ID, so she she can't go on to the case that's supposed to be uh, contoured. So, uh, is anyone else having that? If you had the any mail, لا أخلوا الآيدي مالتهم. Okay, so she and two more colleagues, and they entered the ID, and they find the whole cases is hidden. They cannot find the case. Is there any way that she could share her screen and show us what is happening, or show me what's happening, so we can troubleshoot it? I think the host can open up the share screen for Mayada. عايزينك تفتحي ال share screen. ممكن share معنا the screen. يعني الصورة اللي بعثت لشيها بعثها. يعني هنا بعثها على. Okay. Just just a moment. So Daniel, you are on RCC group. On the WeChat? Uh, what's up? What's up? Sorry. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not using it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let me let me I, get there. <laughs> hold on. I will send you the the screenshot of the problem on RCC. Okay. Thank you so much. So this is what Mayada sent it to me. Who who the screenshot the lady but? Okay. Her ID is MM. 299. So she cannot find her ID when she.